1682 to page 1683. Okay, once again, Romans chapter eight, uh, chapter eight, verses eighteen to twenty-seven. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption, the, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. In our, in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the, Spirit inter, uh, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Amen. Amen. You know, if you hear if you hear groans, you normally don't associate it with pleasant sounds. You normally know, associate it with pain, especially if you hear numerous groans and, and painful uh, groans. You hear, oh my goodness, what's going on? Uh, you don't imagine it to be a lovely thing. Now we know, of course, that the same thing happens. When you, we have all kinds of groans. Certainly, I was thinking of uh, the day here when people go work out. You hear groans, and it's like, actually, when I used to hear groans in the, in the gym, I was like, dude, you're hurting yourself. You're hurting yourself. That can't be good. <laughs> it can't be good if you're groaning. <laughs> um, but you also hear groans, of course, when a, when a woman is going into labor and she's going to give birth. And, of course, you know, I, I remember when my daughter was born and my wife was going through it. I was just like, it's amazing because she's going through pain and, you know, and all this pain, all this suffering. And then the beauty of the baby being born, the glory of it, you're like, oh, wow. But then, you know. The birth of my daughter was one of those mixed feelings kind of things. So I'm like rejoicing on my daughter. Look at my wife who looks like half dead on the table there. Like, you know, she's, she, had, she had to be drugged up, you know. And if you know my wife, my wife doesn't even take a Tylenol, you know. So they had to take a, they had to do a C-section on her and they had to really dope her up. I mean, and she's, and why did they pick something that looks like a crucifix? I don't, I didn't, I was like, why is she on something that looks like this? I'm like, that doesn't look good, people. And, you know, we gotta, we gotta change some of these things. But the groaning, you know, when she was, you know, as they were going at her to, to cut and everything, it was just like, oh my goodness, you know. And then, of course, the joy of the, of the baby. Well, here we see the same kind of thing. We see groanings of different type. We see the groaning of creation, the groaning of God's people, and the groaning of the Holy Spirit, which is awesome. But you can, I can't wait to get to that one. This is a glorious passage. If you've never, if you've never read through like Romans 8, just sat down and read Romans 8, read Romans 8. It is beautiful. It is glorious. It is great. It's like everything you can imagine. You can certainly uh, sympathize with the pain and suffering, but you can also sympathize with the joy, the, the glory that awaits us. And certainly this passage is awesome when you think about the fact that we do live in the in-between time. Christ has not yet come. And so this groaning still continues. And when we look at the evil in this world, you know, I, I feel so bad because I see the evil and then, the evil might be conquered, you know, maybe the war eventually in Ukraine will finish, there'll be peace, whatever, the Middle East will calm down for a while, there'll be peace there for a while, and then, just out of nowhere, it resurges again. Here's another evil comes here, another evil goes there, you know, and it's like, oh, it's September 11, you know, and something always comes up, and it's just a reminder that evil is there, and good people are still trying to, you know, take out the fire, but not able to. And this passage reminds you that, it will be done, but only through Christ. 
and when he returns. And it gives us that sense of expectation. Yes, we should be in harmony with God. And one of the ways that we could be in harmony with God, working towards the kingdom of God, is prayer. The importance of having a prayer life. Now today I know that is very difficult because most people don't pray. Or they pray like, you know, shooting prayers, you know, like then the boss pray, you know. Little, little arrows of, of prayer, but they really don't pray. And then when they pray, they feel that they have to talk. Again, these are all things that we're accustomed to ourselves in, the, in our Western culture. But you'll see here that you don't necessarily have to talk. You just have to be there. And the Spirit will work in you to move you, to speak to God on your behalf. It's a tremendous thing. But the first thing we see here is the groaning of the earth itself, the, the creation. Verse, 13, verse 18, Paul begins says that by saying, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Paul told us a lot already in Romans about suffering. He said, look, suffering, yes, there's suffering is suffering. It's bad. But suffering is also good because suffering produces perseverance. And perseverance produces character. And character brings hope, the Christian hope of the new creation, of what God is doing and will continue to do. What was this, what, what started out badly in the Garden of Eden and has gone really, really, really bad and gotten worse it has now been turned around by Christ and it's now beginning to get better. And when he returns, it will be finalized. And so he says, I consider. And the word there is not just like a passing thought. It is deep philosophical thinking, real pondering upon this issue. Just as he states in 2 Corinthians 4, 17. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs, outweighs them all. You know, if you think of the suffering that we endure in this earth, and certainly we do, but imagine you suffered 90 years, I mean straight 90 years, not like we suffer. We suffer like, you know, maybe for a week, a month, whatever, you know, and maybe as we get older, suffering gets worse, but we don't suffer every single day. I mean, I remember, you know, if anyone had ever told me that, I'd be like, you're a liar. At least it wasn't for me. I mean, I, 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 I've considered myself pretty blessed in my youth. I mean, what I go through, a toothache? I mean, it wasn't like real hardship, real pain, real agony, unless I, unless I butchered myself by doing something stupid on my bicycle and killing myself. You know, the, the pains that I have now, I, the doctor let me know where I got them from. You know, I, I did a lot of stupid things in my youth. But those pains are nothing. If you have 90 years of pain on this earth and then billions of years of joy in the presence of God, what's the comparison? It really can't be compared. That's what Paul means. This, these are light, momentary things. These, yes, they're, they're pain. Paul never denies them. Paul's not a stoic pretending we feel no pain or a Christian scientist. There is no pain. There is no suffering. There is no death. No, he's not that. He knows pain. He's experienced, he's experienced more pain than you and I have ever experienced. All for the sake of the gospel. Not because he was doing stupid things. Not because he did dumb things like I did. No. He does, he saw, all his suffering was because he served Christ. And for that, he got beaten up. They threw stones at him. They, they whipped him. They've done all these horrible things to him. You know, the enemy constantly on top of him. Um, but he says, no, they, you can't compare the suffering and the glory because once you put Christ into the equation, everything changes. Sure, if all we had was suffering and no glory to come, of course, we know that, that you know, there would just be a pipe dream. But because Christ has come and done what he has done, we know there's a glory that awaits us. And when you, once you put Christ into the equation, now the math changes. And we realize that the glory that awaits us is greater than anything else. And it says that the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. Creation itself, nature, the universe, eagerly awaits our redemption for us to be redeemed. Because once we are redeemed, we bring creation in with us. And the eager expectation is almost like standing on tippy toes, hoping, looking, you know, that kind of great thing. You know, when you're, when you're expecting something great in your, in your life and you're looking forward to something being done, you're like, you're looking with great expectation, you know. That's what creation does. That's what we do. You know, when you're looking, you know, as a young man or young woman, you know, you have a date on, on Saturday and you've been looking to meet this girl, meet this guy, and your expect, expectation, you can't wait, you're dying, you know. Uh, or when you have met them, and all of a sudden you're, you're glowing. I remember I was working as a security guard once, 
And this young man, who I knew him to be very, he was, must, must have been 13, 14 years old, very serious little kid. He walks in all glowing. And I looked at him. I said, yep. I said, what's your name? And he was like, how do you know? Because <laughs> you're glowing, dude. You never glow. <laughs> There's only one thing that can make you glow like that. You know? Sure enough. And that expectation, that wonder, that's exactly what creation is looking forward to. And it's looking through our create through our redemption. What is the solution for the earth? How do we save the earth? Save the planet. That's the big thing there. Save the planet. You can't do your bank account. You can't, you can't do the bank account. of America's in debt. We are at war. We are in all these horrors. We keep messing up. Our president forgets what day it is, but he's going to save the planet. You know, no, you're not. Only God can save the planet. You know, but how do we save it? Not by destroying humanity. You know, some people think that the way we save the earth is by killing humans. Did you see that movie Noah when it came out with Russell Crowe? Oh, thank God no trees were killed in the making of that film. Oh, dear Lord, that was horrible. And I had to watch it because I was in that program, Faith and Reason, and we did a show on it. I mean, Noah realizes that the way to really save the earth, save the planet, is to kill all humans. I was like, oh, yeah, that's very biblical. No, it's not. That's not the solution. You know, the solution is not to destroy humans. And the solution is not to pretend the humans are less than creation. Or somehow equal to creation. You know, I see all these books and stuff that make it sound like we are like everything else. And people buy into it. I'm sure many of you in your mind are thinking, oh yeah, me and the chimpanzee, we're equals. Me and the dolphin, we're equals. No, you're not. No, you're not. Me and the mountains, we're equal. Like that book by, uh, what was the guy, John Seed, wrote a book called Think Like a Mountain. And I was like, you know, I, I always think to myself, if I had done drugs in my youth, Maybe somewhere in, in my mind, this will make sense. And I'll say, yeah, man. Yeah, that's right. Think like a mountain. Mountains don't think. <laughs> Mountains don't feel. I mean, you have a better chance of, tell, of telling me think like a dolphin. But don't tell me think like a mountain. You know, it's horrible. But again, it's trying to make us equal with creation. That we are the same. That somehow I am equal to a chimpanzee or whatever. No. Humans, biblically speaking are the pinnacle of creation. So if you're feeling down on yourself, look in the mirror. You're created in the image of God. You are the pinnacle of creation. We have been put on this earth to take care of the earth, to cultivate the earth, to master over the earth, not to, of course, rape the earth and destroy it. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. But we are the lords of the earth. We are God's representatives, the image of God. Why do you need an image of God? Because we represent God upon the earth to creation. That's so important. And that's what we should be. See, the earth is waiting for us to be redeemed. Because in us, it will be redeemed. God subjected the earth to frustration, to the fullness. We fell, but the earth went with us. Why? <clears throat> Because in our redemption, they'll, they'll be brought back. Not because the earth did anything bad. Again, mountains can't think. <clears throat> mountains can't sin. Lions don't sin. When a lion eats a zebra, you don't say, oh, it's sin. It's a murderer. If you do something psychologically wrong with you. It wasn't like the, the, you know, the lion somewhere going, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill the zebra. And plotting somehow to kill the zebra. You know, waiting, waiting to kill it you know, and you're murdering. No, it's an instinct. They act on instincts. We purposely decide. Cain purposely decides to kill his brother Abel. And he could choose otherwise. It's not an instinct. It is for them. They don't sin. But they have been brought into frustration so that they could be redeemed with us. And that leads us to our groaning that we see in verse 23. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship. The redemption of our bodies. God wants to redeem the earth. God wants to redeem our bodies. So many times we've been so influenced by Platonism. And I, I, I say this at the time. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it so often. You'll be like, wow, you're going to know it as a fact. And you're going to meet other Christians. You go, wow, they don't know that? You know? Since the second century, when Gentiles became more and more powerful in the church, Platonism became the philosophy. And Platonism teaches basically 
we can discard the body. The body is just like a car, it's like an instrument. And one day we get rid of it and we, we go off into, into heaven. And then actually according to Platonism, you're, you're reborn, reincarnation. And that's their belief. But they took the Platonism and took it. But that's not what the Bible teaches. God loves creation. God didn't create all this. Think about it. There, there are like so many universes out there. You think God created all that for no reason? He loves it. You know, when I look at trees, when I look at water, I think God must love this stuff because he made a lot of it. He couldn't have made it all for us. I mean, some of it must for us, but he must really love this. He loves creation. He wants to renew creation, redeem creation. If you want to talk in, in modern terms, he's going to recycle creation. Amen. He's not going to throw it away. You know, no, he's going to recycle it. He's going to remake it. He's going to do the same thing for us. We are embodied creatures. Don't ever think that you're just a spirit in a body. You are a, a spiritual body. A body has to be, you are both. And you need both. That's why we will have a new body like Christ. If we didn't need a body, then why did Christ rose from the grave with his own body? Because that's the resurrection body. That's what awaits us. That's the glorious news. We, we were meant to be embodied creatures. You know, when we think about being spirits, we have no problem because we're used to like cast for the ghost and we're like used to like all kinds of things like that. And we think what's normal, you know, oh, if I die, my body stays behind and my spirit goes up. And, that, you know, for Paul, read Paul, 2 Corinthians 4 and 5. He says, oh, there'll be a time when I won't have this body and I'll be in the presence of God and I'll be naked. Naked. For him to not have a body is to be naked. Why? Because we were meant to have a body. When God created us, he didn't create us first spirit and then, oh, let me add something to it. No, he created us right from the earth. He created us as body, as spirit together. Mm -hmm. You know, we need both. And so in the future, we will have both. And so right now we're growing. Why? Because we're in this body. And we feel the aches and pains. And some of us more than others, young people are like, what's he talking about? I don't know what he's talking about. You will know, you will know. <laughs> you know, the aches and pain of arthritis and this and that and everything that comes with it, all this, and it's the groaning of the body. And Paul says, this body is dying, but it's going to be made new. I will have a new body, just like Christ. When Christ rose from the grave, he was a body, a, a resurrected body. When you went into the grave, it was empty. There was nothing there. You know, not like the liberals today say, oh, only the spirit rose. If only a spirit rose, oh my goodness, he really convinced them that he was a body because he was walking through walls and yet eating with them and hanging out with them. They were able to touch him. You know, he had a body. And we will have the same thing. We have the redemption of our bodies. And that is something that has begun already. The new creation already started in us. But it will be fulfilled, completed on the day that Christ returns. That's why Christ, what Paul says, when Christ returns, those who are dead will rise up with their new bodies. And we who are alive... If we are alive at that moment, right now, if the second coming of Christ happened right now, every single one of you and me as believers, our bodies will be transformed because we have not died. We were literally experienced what Christ experienced, where his body was taken and, and, and changed. We will experience that, that transformation. And our physical body will made a spiritual body. And spiritual doesn't mean ghost. Spiritual means of the spirit. It is more solid than us. Remember solid. It's more solid than us. We think that we are solid. We're not solid. When you are spiritual, when you have a spiritual body, if you were able to look at yourself now, you'd be like something transparent. Something you look through. Trans you can't even look at it correctly and say, oh my goodness, that's so vague. That's so foggy. That's so shadowy. We will be real. And that's what awaits us in the future. Uh, and that, of course, is what we are, again, eagerly expecting eagerly looking forward to but then we get to this amazing part you know because in prayer we understand groaning have you ever groaned in prayer yes. yeah okay amen we've grown but we're like oh lord i don't know you know sometimes the pain is so much that we don't know what to say we don't know what to do but now imagine that we even go beyond words and the spirit groans this this is awesome this is beautiful we, we, are, we are right now in the temple of God. We are just worshiping God. This is amazing. Look at verses 26 and 27. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. 
We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. There are times when you are praying and you are so in such agony that you've gone from groans to like, you can't even talk. You are wordless. And at that point, you might think, I'm not praying. And yet you are praying. At that moment, the Holy Spirit is taking your silence, your agony, the misery you're going through, and translating it to the Father perfectly in a way that you could never do. He knows your heart. He knows your pain. He knows your agony better than you do. And He takes that and takes it to the Father Spirit to spirit. And here, of course, he's not talking about some mystical experience like growing, you know, like I'm, I'm speaking tongues. You might not experience anything at all. There's no tongues. You're wordless. You've come to that part of your prayer where you're wordless. You don't know what to say. The evil has been so overwhelming that you don't have words to communicate. But don't stop. Don't get off your knees. Don't stop praying. You are praying. Amen. The Holy Spirit is interceding at that very moment and taking those things that you can't even comprehend at all inside of you and taking it before the Father and translating. The Holy Spirit is amazing. Amen. The Holy Spirit is amazing. He comes to us not only in our joy. We always think of the Holy Spirit in our joy. Here we are. We're, we're singing. We're praising God. Hallelujah. Raising. Oh, yeah. He's in our agony also. Remember the paraclete. The paraclete is the one who comes beside you and stands beside you and encourages you and strengthens you and helps you and guides you. He does all these things. And now we know that He prays for us. Yes. Prays through us to the Father. That's amazing. You know, you're not alone. When you are praying, you think that you're at the end of your rope and no one cares and no one understands. and It's all over. Forget it. It's not. This verse is reminding you the Holy Spirit is there. He's interceding. He understands you. He understands your pain. And now God the Father understands your pain because it's being communicated to Him through the Spirit. This is amazing. This is what the Holy Spirit does for us. Not simply in some sort of pep rally type of encouragement. No, He's there in the full agony of what we're going through. And it gets better. One verse that we haven't dealt with, but it's in verse 34. It says, who then is the one who condemns? And I might preach on this passage too because it's the latter part of all, all of Romans 8 is awesome. Verse 34 says, Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Wow! I've come to a place where I can't pray. I'm beyond words. I'm wordless, but the Spirit is now praying through me to the Father. And the Son is praying on my behalf as well. That is amazing. You, you know, we get caught up in the physical. We always see the physical. And we fail to see the spiritual that is going on. You know, like, and I'll tell you what I mean by that also, even with the evil in the world. We see what's going on in Ukraine. And we say, oh, look at that evil. You don't see the demonic. But the demonic is there. The demonic loves it. The demonic is encouraging that war, bringing destruction, bringing evil. With every dead body, with every horror, it is taking pleasure. And all we see is the physical. We're not aware of the spiritual. This is why, again, in, in Ephesians, Paul talks about the spiritual battle. It's a spiritual battle. There are spiritual beings around us. There's an evil around us that takes pleasure. When you're hurt, oh, it takes pleasure. When it sees you, it takes pleasure. It wants to see you fail. It wants to see you lose. <clears throat> it wants to see you give up on Christ. It wants to see you give up on your faith. It wants to see you give it all up and walk away. This is his pleasure. This is, it takes delight in this. That's the evil that we encounter. And every now and then you're able to get a glimpse of it. You get a glimpse of it when you see an evil person smile. When a hard thing horrible happens or something happens to their enemy, something villainous, and you see them smile, you caught a glimpse of it. But normally we don't see the physical things. We, we, the, we don't see it physically. We only see the physical aspects of it. But there's a spiritual battle going on. And we are engaged in a spiritual battle as well, not a physical battle only. 
It's a spiritual battle. So when you're praying for these things, there's a spiritual element behind them. And be aware that the demonic is there seeking to destroy you. So that's why we need all the help that we can get. And we are getting it. That's the whole thing. Don't let the enemy convince you, fool you, to think that when you're there in your prayer closet, you're alone. You're not alone. Amen. And your prayers are powerful. And that's why he doesn't want you to pray either. Because the prayer of a righteous person, person accomplishes much. Amen. They know this. They're trying to stop you from prayer. What does prayer do? Oh, prayer doesn't do anything. Get out from your knees. Go work. That's real work. Go out there in the streets and do this. And do. Now, go evangelize or go preach. Or go, you know, do, do. That's real work. That is work. But prayer is real work also. Amen. And the most vital real work possible. It should be the work that it precedes, precedes all work. Amen. You know, when I'm, when I'm working on my sermon, I'm praying for my sermon. With, every, with, every, with everything that I'm typing, everything I'm doing, I'm praying for it. I'm, pray, I'm praying for you. Yes. I'm praying that God will use it in your life. Prayer, prayer, prayer. And even when you can't pray, don't get up. Stay there. We are groaning. And we're groaning because we're not yet redeemed. It's not over yet. Is Christ, has Christ come back yet? No. When the Lord returns, it's over. Then we can party. Till then, we are in warfare. And the enemy is going to keep coming at you and coming at you and coming at you. Sometimes through your enemies. Sometimes through your friends. Sometimes through your closest friends. Sometimes there's this person you never expected he would come to. You know, this is the way he works. He's filthy. He's disgusting. He's evil. But we have God on our side. And greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And that's why we know we have the victory. As we pray and groan and allow the Holy Spirit to work in us. Even then... Christ is even now interceding for us as well and our concerns and our needs and our healing and our moving forward. So don't give up. Don't give up. It's not over until the curtain comes down. It's not over. It's not over. And the victory has already been guaranteed because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is the guarantee of our victory. That is our hope. Because he has risen, we will prevail as well. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your glorious salvation. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who has blessed us, strengthened us, guided us. And Lord, we know now, we are reminded that he intercedes for us even when we are wordless, when we cannot pray, when we are beyond ourselves. And certainly this world can take us there through all the struggles, all the agonies, all the things that we have gone through. We just finished going through a pandemic. Lord, we know what it means to be wordless. But we thank you that you hear us because the Spirit intercedes for us. We thank you, Jesus, that you're praying and interceding on our behalf. Dear God, help us to be aware of your presence. To be aware of, of the presence of the Spirit and the Father and the Son all working within our lives. That the enemy will not let us think that all that we see is all that exists. And that there's no other realm. There is another realm. We're so fully aware of it, Lord. We experience it when we feel the presence of the power of the Holy Spirit. Make us aware of that every time we look out. To be able to see things as they really are. To not only see the physical, but to see the spiritual. To see the demonic struggle. To see, Lord, our, the importance of praying for, their, for those situations, dear God. Because we know that you desire to have victory in all those situations. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the peace and fellowship of his Holy Spirit go with us until we meet again. Amen.